everyone. How's it going? Really good to meet you and uh, meet some of you last night and this morning. I'm uh, really pumped to be here. Uh, and in fact, um, I remember the moment when I uh, received the email from Rob asking if I would like to be involved in uh, the TEDx event. And uh, I can tell you what, it did not take long uh, for me to shoot off an email back to Rob uh, saying absolutely, emphatically, my hand is up, I am opting into this. I was over the moon to be invited. I am jumping in, uh, boots and all. And I wonder for yourselves as well, if you remember when you heard about the event, and I wonder for yourselves whether, um, uh, I would imagine that most of us here have opted in. I, I doubt that there is anyone uh, in this room who feels obliged uh, to be here today, that is here begrudgingly or against your will. And so how does that feel? How does it feel that you know you're here of your own free will? Um, furthermore, how does it feel that you know that everyone else here uh, are here of their own free will, that they're here willingly, that they're here, here invested and excited. There's something about that brand of TED uh, and TEDx that we know that we've gravitated towards, and we all share that in common. So today's going to be quite magical just for that reason, is it's the right people in the right place. How would today be different if you hadn't opted in? How would you be feeling now if you were here to tick a box? How would today be different if, say, a few of us or half of us were here begrudgingly? How would the texture of the day uh, play out differently? And then I played this little mind game to myself. I thought, what if this wasn't Ted that we had to go to, this mandated event that I've now invented in my head? What if it was like bizarro Ted? Right? This is an anti-Ted event. <laughs> I came up with the, the rules of this. The, the talks go for at least three hours. <laughs> And uh, they're full of despair. Uh, they don't get to the point. Uh, and all of them have got to finish with this tagline that I've invented, um, uh, which is, uh, uh, it, it probably won't work, so let's not bother. <laughs> Imagine if you were in that event. It goes over a week, by the way. <laughs> Imagine you were uh, in, the, in that, that event. How would you feel in that event? You didn't opt into it. So if we're looking at the power of opting in, then how would you feel in that scenario? Um, uh, in fact, in that instance, you would have had an external stimulus forced upon you, but of course life is not made up of pure external options. In the external world, we often don't get to choose. We often have stimulus that are forced upon us, and I say that as an introduction to this quote by Viktor Frankl, between stimulus and response there is space. And in that space, that internal space, is our power uh, to choose our response. Now, that quote from Frankl comes from the, the book uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, who here has read that? Anyone? A few people? It, um, it emerged from uh, his experience of incredibly, uh, incredible suffering at the hands of evil men over a long period of time. And so he did not choose that experience. That experience was foisted upon him, but what he was able to choose uh, was his response. His choices were, were pushed inward, but he found that inwardly there was choice, choice on how to respond. And he finishes the quote saying, in our response lies our growth and our freedom. I can almost see all of life wrapped up in that quote. Uh, life is a series of stimulus, space, response. Stimulus, space, response. And uh, all the time, we're inwardly choosing how we're going to bounce off what's coming our way. It could be I'm walking along the street, and the corner of my eye, I see a book in a bookshop. And immediately, there's something about the book cover that uh, draws me over to it. I buy it, I take it home, I read it, it changes me uh, forever. It might be a conversation that we have today. It might be a turn of phrase that you use. Uh, and there's something in the, way, the language that you use that I recognize it's external, it's coming in towards me, and I see it, and I recognize that it's valuable. I want to internalize it. I want to bring that inside me and start using that, adding that to my own internal repertoire. I do that all the time. I'm a mimic. I'm always mimicking other people. Even their tone of voice or their rhythms or their body language, there's something about it that I recognize that I value what that's indicating, and then what do I become? Am I a tapestry, then, made up of... Uh, other people's repertoire that has now come over to me. Of course, these things go viral. They create discourse and social cohesion and movements, and we all join together and, um, 
uh, and we sort of resonate with each other. So that's the power of opting in um, that is internal. Uh, there's an interesting aspect of this, though, and I would call it the aspect of unknown unknowns, that I don't know what I don't know. So I don't know what book I'm going to read tomorrow. I don't know what's going to come into my path. Um, I don't know who I will be in five years or ten years. So as we walk through life, these stimulus come in, and some are foisted upon us, and sometimes it's in that mandated experience. Hey, even in this bizarro anti-TEDx thing I've invented, even in the midst of that, it could be that that could be a growth experience because of the way we respond to it. I don't know about you, but I do my personal growth, um, dragged backwards through a hedge kicking and screaming, um, so I wish it wasn't the case, but I do a lot of growing when I'm in a situation I had no choice, no option over whatsoever, um, reluctantly. <laughs> but that's, when, uh, that's how I've gotten to this point, and that's what I imagine is in store down the track. So I don't have control over what's going to happen. It's a blank slate. We don't have control over it. Anything could happen as these things come in. But there's this mirroring uh, and social aspect to it, that I see something in you, you see something in me, and we draw that in and that's how we grow. And it is amazing because then as we grow internally and we expand our repertoire and these experiences endorse who we are and what we stand for and where we're heading and we group up with others around like-minded um, uh, goals, we become unstoppable. A person who knows who they are and where they're heading and has a tribe around them, that's unstoppable. That's magical. You look throughout history, everything significant that has happened has come out of that, that emphatic direction uh, that grows over time and then uh, leaps into the future. It's magical. It's magical, but it's unscriptable and it's empty space. It's scary in that regard because it can't be controlled. What might this look like in school? How might we um, uh, sort of leverage this effect and, and encourage and nurture this effect in school, especially when we're all heading in different directions? Students all care about different things. They're at a certain link in the chain. And at this point in time, they care about something. They're pursuing something. They have an internal repertoire, internal self-talk. And they might be grouping up around that, or they might be going off in lots of different directions. So how is that going to play out if we can't control stimulus, space, response? We can't script that. We can't script somebody else's response. How is that going to not be anarchy if we actually want to encourage that unpredictable to happen. What happens when you put experts in? Do we block or do we corral or do we coach? What happens there? And in what sense out of these interactions can shared purpose actually emerge? Um, how can it not be anarchy? How can something magical uh, bounce up out of that? And I put that graphic in not to indicate that we all end up in the same space, but to indicate that out of those interactions, um, some kind of resonance can occur. And um, uh, and it's not anarchy. There's something that's palpable that is drawing people together. How can that happen in a, in a school situation? Well, we've all experienced it, haven't we? Those moments uh, when the classroom was just humming and everyone was activated and no one was quite in control. So that's great. We recognise it. Um, uh, hopefully that happens most days. So then my question is, but how far could we push it? If we know that it's there, and if we know that it's possible, how far can we push that dynamic? How far can we lose control? And, uh, and uh, just what amount of energy could actually be unleashed um, as a result of that? Now, that's a question that we've been uh, really grappling with for the last 10 years at my school, um, really trying to take bold risks uh, uh, to reinvent what we do and promote this sort of dynamic where, where there's an ecosystem of... Um, of stimulus and response, and kids are all growing, but they're growing in directions we can't quite script and we don't quite know how they're going to end up. How far could we push that? How high could we, um, could we aim there? Now, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll run straight into a little time-lapse film that I've, uh, I took of a, a visual arts lesson the other day. Uh, and one thing you'll notice there, I'm sure there's big connections with what's been happening in Bendigo here. In terms of space, we took down walls here to combine two classes together. And just in that very first uh, few moments of, um, of the session, we have two teachers there. And uh, not just the one teacher, the two teachers are interacting with each other. Who knows what's happening there? Who knows what will be the result of that very initial interaction? Um, 
something improvised possibly, something unscripted, we don't know. Okay, I'll let that play and we'll see uh, how this plays out. So you can see the movement. You might ask yourself as you're watching, is this chaos or anarchy? Is it falling apart or is it working? You can maybe decide a little bit based just on the visuals there. Track through what each student uh, is doing in that space. The physicality of it. And then here in this moment, uh, I want to point out something. That even in this fluidity uh, uh, that looks um, perhaps a little bit organic, there is actually in the background there a teacher-led session. So remember this question of the unknown unknowns and the question of compulsory experiences which we're kind of um, forced into. Well, the kids don't know what they don't know, and they're not going to rediscover that automatically. So that's the stimulus, and it's a stimulus that those students have to engage with if they're doing that particular project. And we have the expert who knows more and who is able to then interact in that, what we would call a guru session, uh, to help the students there. And uh, we don't know how the students will respond to that, but we're putting that experience, we're structuring in that experience into this space. At the same time, the other teacher is of course engaged in some kind of interaction there. We don't know what's happening, but if you follow that teacher through, you'll see him, uh, Craig, he's sort of uh, uh, pushing around the place. So that's, um, that's visual arts. Something a lot more ambitious um, is our year five and year six program. That's 180 students uh, all day, every day, uh, in one shared space uh, with a team of uh, six teachers. That's only half of the space. Uh, you're seeing about 90 students there. And uh, this is the result of 10 years of, uh, of trying to nurture this dynamic. Uh, but again, there's absolutely structure that is operating there. If we look over here, uh, this guru session run by Dan uh, is repeated six different times uh, across a fortnight. And the students know that and they opt in when the time is right. But if they're doing that project, they have to opt in because we have to look at unknown unknowns. We believe in expertise, we believe in direct instruction as well. At the same time, it's, it's like what we saw in visual arts but scaled up. We have uh, a teacher here working one-on-one -on -one just at that point of need. You know, th this couldn't have been predicted, it couldn't have been scripted, the time is right, the stimulus is there, there's space, and then how will that student respond? And then there's a third teacher over here who is scanning, roaming, looking to a place to go, and there's another three teachers and another, another 90 students and some of them are actually outdoors. Have a look at this student here. They look a bit like they're in their cave space, right? They're, they're lost in thought. They're, they look a little bit like a, a lone wolf happening there. Um, but in just a few moments, we'll see what happens. And as it happens, uh, his friends come over. And uh, again, not scripted, definitely not in the lesson plan. Um, it's organic and, and it's emerged. What's happening there? Is that student seeing uh, what's developing, what the, how the project is developing, how will they bounce off that? Will one of the students gravitate to what they're seeing and actually pull that in and integrate that into what they want to do? Another student might say, no, I don't want to go that direction, and we don't know how it's going to play out. And so then it becomes a question of how do we nurture that effect without it falling apart, without it becoming a vacuum, without losing that stimulus. It's not just space response, it's stimulus space response. So how will we organize that? So I have a suggestion. And the suggestion is simply um, that this term, a learning landscape, might be a lens through which to see how we work. Instead of thinking a lesson plan, thinking a, le a learning landscape. And the critical question behind that is, how can we, um, how might we create a space that nurtures these effects? And then how we do that's another question, but there's an interesting question in the first instance. Uh, how might we create a space where these effects can, can grow uh, in that force multiplying way without things becoming chaotic or anarchic? And uh, I have a suggestion as well that, that learning landscape is composed of three layers. And I actually think we're in those three layers right now in this room. And uh, uh, I'll go through them. The first one is physical space. Evidently, we are in physical space right now. Physical space has affordances and it has constraints. And Winston Churchill said, we shape spaces, then the spaces shape us. And the physical space itself is an agent. It creates possibilities and it prevents possibilities. For us, empty space is important. Uh, furniture on wheels, things that uh, you can push in and push out and reconfigure because we don't know what's going to happen. 
Then this idea of virtual space, but I don't mean tech by the phrase virtual space. I don't mean technology. What I mean is information flow. So when I say the virtual layer of space in this room right now, what I mean is, for instance, my vocal cords creating vibrations, they go through the air, they go in your ears. There's information that is swirling around us all the time. Maybe through the air, yeah, maybe on a computer, maybe on, a, on print. Uh, if you're engaging on Twitter, information is swirling around in this space via Twitter. So there's a whole ecosystem of information that's there in space. And then the, uh, uh, the third layer is um, uh, headspace. It's the most invisible of all. You might call it cultural space. And yeah, it's private. I can't get into your head, you can't get into mine. But there is a layer of headspace that's in this room right now. A layer of like-mindedness or not, or whatever, uh, bouncing off each other. Now, in a, in a learning landscape, what will this mean? We can't control people's heads, but we can nurture a certain culture. And I believe you can do this with intent and deliberately. So you might debrief with the students. We might say, what are we going to be like? How about this? What permissions will we give you? And under what conditions can you move? Can you talk? Do you need to ask permission to talk? And so there's questions of, uh, of uh, where, where, what the common understanding of the rules of engagement are. So in all of these three spaces, we're looking at structures. What are the structures that will hold this thing, this learning landscape together? I want to just drill down now into that virtual layer in a bit more detail. And I want to show you what's on our kids' screens. You saw they had computers in that virtual layer of space. And uh, so those visual arts students, that's what they can see on their screen. It's six different projects. They each opt into any of those projects for a term. So at any point, the kids are doing one of who knows which projects. When they click on the icon for their project, it takes them in to uh, video explanations. Uh, this deals with the unknown unknowns. This is what they need to know. And, uh, and that's made by our own teachers, step one, step two, and some print instructions that they can follow. Uh, uh, then um, uh, this is uh, primary, the zone, year five and year six, the 180 students. You've got, uh, uh, for instance, during the mathematics time, they click on numeracy, that takes them through to this screen. They click on number one for week one, when they're in week one, that takes them in here, and that has a, a sort of curated learning path that they can follow. So they're not in a vacuum, there's the stimulus. It has instructions, it has resources, it has checkpoints, and it has feedback loops. Uh, this is the year five, year six, um, one of their integrated projects. Again, they get to click, they're creating an eco-village. But if I just quickly bounce back to the physical space and physical structure, they carved out this space. It's half a classroom's worth of space. At the start of the term, it was empty. We didn't know what would happen. And the students themselves split up into architects, you know, transport managers, um, and uh, these different roles. And step by step throughout the term, this space became what it is. But it wasn't scripted. We didn't know what would actually end up happening. Uh, in, um, in French, in high school, for instance, they might have this up on screen. So they can choose from these uh, different aims at different times. Uh, then when they, when they drill in, they get a video instruction from teachers, uh, and then uh, uh, that's all scripted into a kind of pathway. They work their way around the circle. They click on it. It takes them through. And then let's say they get to the choice section. Uh, then they have these choices that they can engage. Um, now it might look like we've overscripted, right? We've curated these pathways. But of course, once you've got the pathways, the kids can leave the path and go elsewhere. Um, so there's, uh, and, and we don't know how that will play out, but kids can gravitate to what they need. And with the teachers in the mix interacting, it all kind of works together. So what's the, what's the, what's the um, challenge here? Uh, what's, um, what are we trying to do? Design a space, a space with structure, a space with constraint, a space with unknown unknowns, a space with expertise, a space with choice, where the students are constantly um, engaging with this rich series of stimuli that are coming in, they can choose that, they can choose that, they can reject that, they're interacting with each other, they're interacting with a teacher. We don't know how it's going to play out. But each individual there is maximized. They're actively constructing themselves. Hopefully, in this um, organic movement, they are finding themselves. And they're finding themselves uh, and, and building up who they are, uh, figuring out who they are, what they stand for, what their internal, their internal repertoire will be. 
And once you know that, uh, you become powerful. We are talking about that mix between self-actualization and then social actualization together. And it all comes from that moment uh, which we started off with uh, Frinkel, uh, Fr Fr uh, Victor Frankel. Stimulus, space and response. And in that space is our power to choose. Um, and indeed, we don't know how it will play out. But in that space is the, uh, the power to, to opt in. Um, thanks so much.